Hey everyone, so if you're anything like me, you've probably played a lot of games online, and so you've probably seen or heard of this thing called an ELO rating. Whether it's chess, or League of Legends, or Pokemon Showdown, people talk about the ELO systems all the time. But what is it? Why is it? And why don't some people like it? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to take a brief look through the historical record and see if we can recreate the ELO system and see how some more modern systems improve upon the classical ELO system. So the ELO system was first developed in the 50s by Arpad ELO, a Hungarian-American physicist who was probably not yet a fan of Mr. Blue Sky. ELO was, on the other hand, a big fan of chess. And as we all know, when physicists get really into something, they waste, I mean, they apply their knowledge to their own interests, solving problems in different ways than everyone else. And one eternal question that people had back then, as they do now, is, well, who's the best chess player? I mean, you can always have tournaments and see who wins and loses, but what if someone doesn't turn up on the day, or doesn't play the right person, or just has a bad day? Well, that is why we have an ELO system. Writes ELO, the purpose of a rating system is to provide a ranking list of the players. Tournament standings provide a tentative ranking, but because individual performances vary, a ranking listed based on a single event is not always reliable. Furthermore, it may be necessary to compare performances of players who have never met in direct competition. A rating system therefore attempts to evaluate all the performances of an individual on some sort of scale, so that at any point in time, players may be listed in the probable order of their strength. Such a list is of immense interest in itself. It provides a convenient vehicle for promotion and publicity for chess or any other competitive activity. So at its core, this means that rating systems are rather simple. We just need a way to figure out who's the best. And, you know, we can do that without needing too much math. Uh, we can just say, you know, star ratings at around 1,000 points and say if we win a game, we win 100 points. If we lose a game, we lose 100 points. We can simplify this by writing it as the equation on screen, where R0 is your initial rating, R is your current rating, and R prime is your new rating. Here, S is your score, which is 1 if you win and 0 if you lose. So let's try the system. Uh, the other day, I grabbed three of my friends to play a quick chess tournament and see how our ratings change. So playing here today, we have me, Ralph, hi. Uh, we have Mishi, we have Lucia, and we have Alessandra. Thanks to these guys for joining me through this strange adventure. But yeah, so really quickly, Mishi wins, and wins, and wins, so he ends up at 1,300 points. 1,000 points plus 100 points for every win. I lose every game, because I'm great, and end up at 700 points. Lucia ends up at 1,100 points, Alessandro on 900. So the rating system, by this order, says that Mishi is first, then Lucia is second, then Alessandro is third, and I'm last which matches what we expect from the results. So yeah, this system actually sort of works in terms of ranking, but that's not really satisfying, is it? Um, these numbers like 700, 1100, 1300, they don't mean anything. Elo addresses this in his progress report in 1960, writing, all the principal rating systems are basically identical, even though the formulae may superficially look different. The fact is that when the formulae are generalized, they are either of identical algebraic form, or, if of seemingly different form, derivable from one another. Wow, the guy really was a physicist. But so the main thing that ELO ended up doing, the main innovation of the ELO system, was to make these numbers, the differences between scores, actually meaningful, and to give them some predictive power on how likely you are to win rather than just if you were expected to or not. So what the USEF, uh, the chess governing body, what they did was make sure the average player had a score of 1500, and they said make a 400 ELO difference mean that the person with the higher score is going to win 10 out of 11 times, win 10 times more than they lose. So let's see if we can retrace ELO steps and adapt my less good system into ELO's much better one, one that actually has predictive power. So yeah, first off, we want a 400 ELO difference to mean you win 10 out of 11 times. Sure, so let's draw this on a plot. On the x-axis, we have a difference in the ELO, and the y-axis, you have the expected chance of winning. 
Now in a good rating system, we'd expect a few more data points than just this one point. For example, if two players have the exact same ELO, we'd expect to see a 50% chance of winning or losing, so right here in the center. Of course, if one player's ELO is much higher than another's, we'd expect an almost 100% chance of victory. So as the ELO difference increases, we'd expect the win rate to approach or asymptote towards 100% to a certain win. Finally, we'd expect this plot to be perfectly symmetrical, which makes sense. So if your ELO is 400 higher and you have a 10 out of 11 chance of winning, we expect to have a 1 in 11 chance of winning if your ELO is 400 lower. And honestly, that's basically all we really know about how the ELO system should be set up. Well, we'd also like this plot to be what we call monotonically increasing, or in other words, it just always goes up. But other than that, we basically fill all of the explicit and implicit requirements for this predictive rating system. We just need to connect the dots in some sort of reasonable way, which we can do with a lot of different types of functions. Um, we can do it with a normal cumulative distribution function, for example, but this is pretty complicated and I'd rather not introduce errors. So instead, today we're going to use a simpler base 10 logistic function. The logistic function in its general form looks like this, where mu and s are variables that we can pick. Mu is the mean, uh, the midpoint of the plot. So here, because you want an ELO difference of 0 to mean a 50% chance of winning, we can easily just set mu to 0 so the plot's symmetrical. Easy. S is a bit more complicated. S represents the standard deviation of the distribution, or just how flat or sharp this little turn is. But since we know that when x, or the ELO difference is 400, we have a 10 out of 11 chance of winning, we can just do some algebra. We can solve for S and see that S is a very clean 400. And yeah, that's the ELO system basically made. Now our numbers actually mean something. So if your ELO is, say, 100 higher than your friends, we can either plug it in this equation or read it off this plot and see that you have, for example, a 64% chance of winning. Well, okay, so that's how it works statically if nothing changes in this steady state. But a rating system is not going to be static. It's not going to be very useful if you can change your rating, right? So how do we know if rating should change? And if it should change, how do we know how much it should change by? Uh, for example, let's say Mishi's ELO is 400 higher than mine. As we said before, that means if we play 11 games, Mishi should win 10 times. So let's say we actually do do that, and Mishi does win 10 times out of 11. In that case, the ELO rating was perfectly accurate in its prediction, which means we should not expect our ELOs to change, because it was correct. On the other hand, if Mishi won all 11 games, that means he may well be better than our rating difference could describe, which means his ELO should increase and correspondingly, my ELO should decrease. Of course, if he only wins 9 out of 11 games, in other words, I beat him twice, then the opposite should happen. Since he won fewer games than what was expected, his ELO rating should decrease and mine should increase. That means you can just use these numbers to calculate your change in ELO. If your real score is higher than your expected score, you gain ELO, and if your real score is lower than your expected score, you lose ELO. We can write that as an equation like this, where r prime is your new rating, r is your current rating, s is your real score, and e is your expected score. And if you remember, we learned that you can calculate e via this equation, where delta r is the difference between your ELO and your opponent's ELO. Now you might notice that this equation looks surprisingly similar to the rating system that I made up at the beginning of this video. That's basically just what ELO meant when he wrote that rating systems tend to be of either identical or similar algebraic form. But anyways, the one variable that I haven't explained to you yet is this k, which ends up being the most variable part of different ELO implementations. k here is just some value that describes how much ELO you can gain or lose in a single match. So if k is really, really, really small, you'll have to play a lot of games to get an accurate estimate of your score. If, on the other hand, k is really, really big, that means your ELO is going to change a lot. And so it's going to go up and down a lot even when it shouldn't. Now, different games use different values of k. And the value of k can also change depending on how good you are. Um, so FIDE, the chess federation, for example, has k change between 10 and 40, depending on your current rating, how many games you've played, and your current age. Pokemon Showdown, on the other hand, has a k between 32 and 50, depending on your current ELO. 
But if your elo is below 1100, K is high if you win and low if you lose. So that more points go into the system at lower levels. Age of Empires 2 has a constant value of K at 32 after your placement games. So different games just do different things. Today, for our system, let's just set K to be really high to 200, just so we can see differences in ELOs quick. And let's go back to the chess tournament from before to try and figure out how our ELOs would work. So let's start from scratch and put everyone's score at 1000 again. Let's take this first game. Luchi and Mishi both have 1000 ELO. We can calculate the expectation from the formula earlier and see that per the ELOs, they're both expected to have a 50% chance of winning because the ELO is the same. In the first game, Mishi wins, so we can put the score and the expectations into both of these formula and see that Mishi's new ELO is 1100 and Lucia's new ELO is 900. In the second game, when Mishi goes up against me, since his ELO is higher than mine, he's expected to be more likely to win. In this case, he's said to have a 64% chance of winning, and so since he expected to be more likely to win, he's only going to be getting 71 points when he wins instead of the 100 he got from the first game. Of course, Lucia, who lost her first game, is thus expected to lose against Alessandro this time. But she doesn't. Uh, she wins. So now her ELO shoots up 128 points to 1,028. Alessandro, who was expected to win, loses a lot of points and ends up at 872. And we can do the same thing for the last three games and calculate each of our ELOs at each step to see that at the end, Mishi has a rating of 1202 and I'm way down at 752. And these numbers, in theory, if we played enough, would give us an accurate mathematical assessment of our skills and ratings. Now, you can see a few times where we pick things completely arbitrarily. We got to decide from the start what numbers actually mean. You know, so we decided that a 400 ELO increase means you win 10 out of 11 times. We also decided the particular distribution. You know, we could have chosen normal distribution. We picked the logistic just because it was easier. And also we decided how quickly ELOs could change. You know, I didn't have to pick 200, I could have picked something smaller or larger for that value of K. But even then, the system ends up much, much better than the system I originally devised because it's actually rooted in statistics because it actually means something, these numbers. And yeah, so that is the ELO system. It's pretty cool. But like I said at the start, the ELO system has some issues that have been superseded in modern times by a few other systems including, for example, the Glico system. But why? Well, ELO has a few different issues. One is that pesky K factor we spoke about. Basically, we spoke about how a lot of systems make sure the K value is really high when you're starting and then drops later on when your score stabilizes. The values of K are manually set at arbitrary discrete points. The first thing that Glico does is make sure this process is completely automatic. It introduces this factor called rating deviation, which is a function of how much you play, and takes that and puts that more or less as the K factor. So when you're starting out, or how you haven't played in a while, your rating deviation is really, really high, so your glico will change a lot. If you play a lot of games, and you're consistent in your performance, then the glico will change less. Another thing that glico tackles is unpredictability and style of play. Uh, take me for example. When I play chess, I blunder a lot. I make a lot of silly mistakes, more than most people at my skill level. Uh, my gameplay is thus highly variable. Uh, so while my elo might be similar to someone, uh, if someone has a similar elo to me, I might do better against better opponents, but do worse against worse opponents just because I'm more likely to make a lot of mistakes. To target the issue, uh, to target the issue of consistency, Glico 2 introduces what they call rating volatility which is how consistent you are as you play. The rating volatility goes into the rate deviation. So again, if I'm highly volatile in my play style, I'll gain and lose more points. But if I'm very consistent, I'll gain and lose fewer points. Now, Glico does solve this problem or the value of K, but it does still maintain some of ELO's old problems. The big one, I think, is how ratings can inflate or deflate. In other words, be worth less or more over time. Uh, this happens because ELO points can be added or removed into the system at times. Uh, that naturally happens when players you know, start playing, they're going to introduce their points to the system, and when they retire, they're going to take their points with them when they leave the game. Now, these effects can be mitigated by artificially adding or removing points into the system, but it does mean that it's hard to compare ELOs across different time periods. You know, So you can't just compare Magnus Carlsen, the best player in the world right now, to Bobby Fischer, the old best player of the world, ages back, you can't compare them by looking at their ELOs. 
one player or the other player could have ended up overrated in the true meaning of the word. The rating could have ended up higher than usual due to rating inflation or lower than usual due to rating deflation. But this asks one question then. Why is ELO anyway if it has so many issues? Why hasn't everyone already just jumped to Glico? So there is one issue that Glico does introduce. Since the rating deviation depends on how many games you play, that means you can't calculate Glico's after every single game. You need to complete what they call a rating period, which is an amount of time or an amount of games. And thus, you can recalculate how many games you play within that frequency. So if you play many games in a row, you can see your Glico change after every single game, which can be a bit annoying if you want to track your improvement, for example. But honestly, I don't think that's the main reason. I think the main reason why ELO is more popular is just because it's so much more simple than the Glico system. There's a reason I decided to make this video about ELO and not about Glico. This equation is way, way simpler than these equations. What's more, it's really easy to conceptualize and understand what ELO means. It's easy to realize that, oh, 400 difference in ELO, 91% chance of you winning. With Glico, it's much more complicated. We need to take into account these two different numbers, and you need to compare these two different numbers to see if you're more likely to win or not. And if you're just going to report the first number, you may as well just use ELO. Now, there are a few ways that people have tried to make Glico simpler. For example, Alexander Exact Ferugia, a lecturer at the University of Malta, published on the Pokemon fan site Smogon what ended up being called the GXE, the Glico Exact Estimate, which compares one player's Glico rating to the entire community to see how likely this particular person is able to beat the average player in their community. This is much simpler than the overall Glico system. It adapts the Glico system to be a method that is much more easier to understand, but this hasn't been fully extended into other games. I do want to end this video by saying that everything I've discussed so far works in an idealized rating system that's made purely to rate players. However, in a lot of modern digital games, this isn't the main purpose of these so-called rating systems. Today, by design and what I think is player choice, we've started to look at ELO systems less as a rating system and more as a point or score or reward system. We play games to get more points. Remember, true rating systems describe your skill level. They aren't made to reward you. But in a lot of digital games, things like League of Legends or Pokemon Unite, the opposite is true. You know, these games get regular ladder resets every periodic season to intermittently reset your score to just drop your rating. These aren't designed to help you find your true rating. They are designed to make you play more, to be fun, to reward you for winning by giving you more points or skins or just a higher rating in general. The true rating becomes gamified and the priorities go from accurately rating a player to create what is arguably a more enjoyable or more addictive reward system. Now, there isn't a value judgment. I did love climbing in Pokemon Unite when I played the game, but it is an interesting observation that there's this transition from accurate true rating systems to this more gamified system of rewards. But yeah, so in conclusion, that is hopefully all you needed to know about ELO and rating systems. Today, we learned that rating systems are designed to create an objective judgment of player skill in a game. We learned that the ELO system, unlike its predecessors, has differences in rating mean something, mean something predictive in your win rate. And this prediction can also be used to calculate changes in ELO after a win or loss. We also learned about the ELO variable K, which can be changed to describe how quickly an ELO changes. And we learned about trade-offs between a high K and a low K in terms of speed and accuracy. We also learned about the Glico systems and how to introduce rating deviations and volatility to better judge variations in play. And we learned how despite that, the simplicity of the ELO system ensures it's much more popular in the common lexicon. But yeah, and that is this video on ELO systems. I've been Sontide, hope you all enjoyed this, and hope to see you all in the next one. Bye.